And we are live. Welcome everybody to today's meetup. Good evening for my case, or probably still good morning for you, Courtney. Or it is. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> or good morning. <laughs> if you if you already joined, um, great to have you all here. Um, feel free to just um locate the chat and say hi. Um, maybe include your location so that we know whether it's evening or morning for you or anything in between. Um, if you write in the chat, make sure to select all participants before writing this, because otherwise only Kurt and I will be able to read this and that would be a shame. Great. Henrik, you figured it out um, to everyone. Nice. Uh, hello to Sweden. Same time zone than I'm in. I'm in Germany. Um, hey, Lucas. So we give this um, a few more minutes before we start to allow people to join. Uh, maybe a few, ah, hi, hi to Oregon, USA. Good afternoon. Yeah, very different time zones. I like that. Um, the real confusion for me will start next week with Europe switching by one hour. Um, it always creates confusion. Hi to California, nice. Um, all right, maybe a few housekeeping rules. Um, so this meeting is being recorded, as you can see. So we'll share the recording with you tomorrow in an email, um, maybe including some useful links. Um, I listen very carefully, Courtney, and if there's anything that I should add, I, I make sure to add it to the, um, to the email. Um, Lars, welcome, but make sure to select to everyone before writing. You just wrote to hosts and panelists, um, somebody else from, from Sweden. Um, if you have questions um, during um, Courtney's presentation, then feel free to either drop them in the chat that you already found um, or put them in the Q&A section. Um, if you want to make sure they get answered, the Q&A section might be the better place um, because questions don't get lost that easily there. Uh, but I'll actually monitor both and then make sure that the questions are actually asked um, towards the end. So I think we give this another minute um, before, before we get started. All right, so I think three minutes in, it's good. Um, I'm pretty sure there'll be some people joining a bit later, but that's perfectly fine. Um, so welcome everybody again. Um, really happy to have you here um, for this uh, meetup. And uh, I have uh, the wonderful Courtney with me today. Um, and she'll talk about her journey from Nordstrom to Nike to maybe your current position, but we'll learn about that uh, more later. Um, maybe to introduce myself, I'm Christoph. I'm co-founder of Humanitech. Um, we are providing internal developer platforms for enterprises, um, but this meetup is not going to be about that. Um, but maybe also as a small promotion, we just also um, founded a platform engineering community in Slack um, to exchange ideas um, between platform engineers because we, we see how important this topic is and make sure to include the invitation to that Slack space um, in the follow-up email. So if you're interested to join and to discuss things and to get help and get, pers get, get different perspectives on things, um, feel free to do so. Um, and with that, I'm happy to hand over to you, um, Courtney. Um, great to have you here um, and really looking forward to your learnings uh, along your journey on how to build internal platforms and how to make them work. So. <laughs> floor is yours. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I'll just, I'll just start going uh, through this. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about kind of my own personal journey and then some very specific examples um, around leveraging platforms and some of the companies that I've worked at. So super quick uh, background. Hopefully if I can get my slides to advance. We are not... Okay, there we go. Um, yes. 
You got it. All right. Super quick. I've been in the tech industry for, for quite some time. And I really started in infrastructure engineering. So operations background, uh, worked at a couple startups, and then I moved to Nordstrom. And I spent 14 years at Nordstrom. I started in security engineering and then moved around in uh, infrastructure and operations, kept getting closer to the customer. And uh, my final role at Nordstrom was leading what we called our customer facing engineering team. So mobile development, retail technology, personalization, loyalty. After 14 years, decided to go to Starbucks and get a global opportunity leading retail technology there, which essentially was global POS across all uh, store footprint at Starbucks. Very different and exciting. From there, I went to Nike, where the role that I started in was leading digital platform engineering, so near and dear to our uh, topic today. And that included very similar to what I was leading at Nordstrom. So our consumer data platform, our content, digital asset management platform, um, identity, user services, inventory, order management, bunch of different technology across uh, the Nike digital ecosystem. Then I moved in global supply chain and logistics. And then my final role there was leading our ERP implementation. Now I'm at Zulily. I uh, started in January as CTO. Um, it's a great company. Been around about 11 years, all digital retail, and I'm in the process of uh, learning what we need to focus on. And some of it's very relevant to the topic today. Um, we are looking at our architecture and our platforms and our APIs and figuring out what's the right amount of standardization and platform approach to take. Super passionate about learning and creating a dynamic learning organization, generative culture, psychological safety, people. I think people are the number one uh, asset in any organization. Leaders should care and show up in that way. And I strive to be a lifelong learner. And then for fun, uh, I love to sing. I am terrible at it, but I really enjoy it. So I uh, tend to... Um, to sing some karaoke when I get a chance. All right, so super quick. Uh, every organization's different. Um, so one thing I've learned throughout, you know, Nordstrom, Starbucks, Nike, and now Zulily is that every organization, every culture is different, but there are common patterns and anti-patterns. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in more detail. Um, and I'm a big believer in the first 90 days framework. So whenever I take a new role, I use that framework to really take the time to understand the situation that I'm in and ask a lot of questions so that I can learn. Okay. Stopped advancing again. Okay, here we go. I know this is a lot of words, but I wanted to pull <laughs> out the content and not, you know, try to, you know, repackage it. But for the, uh, 2021 State of DevOps report, there was so much content around why platforms matter and whether it's platform teams or platforms themselves. And I think the main takeaway here that I wanted to talk about as I lead into the examples is treating your platform as a product, which I think takes a mindset change. I don't think there's always been this focus on treating platforms in that manner. And it's extremely critical, I think, in order to uh, achieve success and sustain success. Um, another key data point that I think is super important from State of DevOps, and then I pulled some content from Dr. Ron Westrom, who the Westrom model, this is why I talked about generative culture. I'm a big believer in that. Not only is your platform approach important, but how teams interact is critical. How does information flow? How do teams work together? And even if you take a platform as a product approach, if there's no focus on team interaction and how inter the information flows throughout your organization, you'll only gain limited success. And so I'm a big believer in this as well, ways of working, how do you really um, understand the flow of value and how do you optimize for teams to have the least amount of friction in the work that they're doing? 
Okay. I like to tell this story because this was a big aha moment for me in my journey. And it led to a lot of focus on platforms. So most organizations treat technology or IT as a cost center. And often the focus is on how can you get as much much efficiency as possible out of technology. When I was at Nordstrom in 2012, we had this big initiative where we said digital is our growth channel. And basically we need to stop focusing on cost and we need to start focusing on speed. Now, speed, and this is also in the state of DevOps report, if you're doing speed right, you're not compromising stability and quality. So I'll just say that out of the gate. Um, But I think sometimes organizations, when they start to focus on a platform approach, they focus on consolidation, cost savings. How do we make this an efficient platform versus how do I ground it in delivering value high quality, speed, and optimizing for the developer experience. And so for me, I try to really focus on, if you do speed right, you can get cost and efficiency. If you do cost and efficiency as the leading focus, you're not gonna get speed. So I'm gonna tell some stories from Nordstrom. So the first story I'm gonna tell, because this team was trailblazing when I was, when we started to shift our mindset. And it was our infrastructure organization. So many of you have probably been in this scenario where prior to going to cloud, everything was in a data center, on-prem, provisioning, lead time could be months, often was months, and you didn't have the flexibility and the scale. And often it required sending a ticket into a shared service team, and then you waited for your for your infrastructure to be provisioned. So our infrastructure team took a step back and said, we want to set a North Star of self-service, essentially lead time of minutes versus months. And how might we do that? And they did a value stream map. I'm also very passionate about that to understand where were the bottlenecks in the existing provisioning process. And designed for the persona of developers. So our customer is a developer. And it really was a huge unlock for the teams to understand where they needed to focus in order to enable that. And a lot of it turned into self-service APIs and really cloud as a platform and how could we provision services in a more effective way. Another example. So our customer mobile organization. So this was essentially our iPhone app. Uh, It was really the iPhone app because that was the primary usage at the time. Our customers were using our iPhone app. We were not moving fast enough. In fact, when when we looked at our delivery, it was twice a year, which is an eternity in digital. And so the team went through and said, how can we create platforms and APIs so that we can go faster. And one of the things they focused on, which I thought was great, was let's never have an actual person log into production. Let's automate our No one is hands on keyboard pushing code to production. And it created this great uh, opportunity for us to think differently about code deploys. Because up until that point, it was, we had a release management team and you submitted a ticket and then you waited and then it went to the Apple store, which you still had to wait for. But we were basically in a position where we said, we don't want technology to be in the way. Let's create these self-service APIs and an underlying capability so that we don't have to ever log into production. Now, earlier I talked about why Uh, ways of working and interactions matter. And this was also something this team focused on. They said, we have a lot of handoffs. We have a lot of different teams that are part of our value stream. And that's not working great. We don't have great feedback loops. We have, we send things to our quality organization and then maybe 
weeks later, we hear if we had a defect or not. Quality should be owned in the team. We should own production incidents. I mean, all of this probably sounds like, of course you would do that. But back then, it wasn't really happening. I mean, DevOps was out in the industry, but a lot of organizations were still not practicing the true, you build it, you run it, you own it. And so we did a bunch of silo, you know, breaking down silos and setting outcomes that allowed the team to be focused on stability and resilience, as well as feature delivery. Okay, I'm going to tell a story from Nike. And I found this uh, because I truly believe that this is true. Just because you build a platform doesn't mean people are going to consume it. <laughs> and so it has to be, it has to solve a need, it has to be compelling, and it has to be an ongoing, um, I'll just call it a, you, you need to treat it like a product. If you deliver a product to a customer, you don't let it go stale. You're constantly improving and iterating on it. Same thing with platforms. And so this story probably will sound familiar. There was an effort underway and a charter delivered to a platform team to essentially consolidate all deployment pipelines. And the drivers behind it were really saving money. And, you know, how do we get everybody on the same standard? And senior leaders, myself included, were asked to mandate adoption. Like just say, everyone's going to move to the pipeline you have until this date. And instead, what we shifted to was, do we know if this platform is meeting our developers' needs? I think adoption is a way to know. If no one's adopting your platform, then that's probably an indicator. But how do you really get to the why behind the lack of adoption? And so one thing that we weren't doing, and this is where the product mindset comes in, is capturing NPS for the pipeline. Would you refer a friend or colleague to this pipeline? We learned so much just from asking that simple question because team members weren't always elevating exactly why and what the friction was or the gaps in the um, feature set. So that created a really great platform. And then we started talking about NPS and adoption in our monthly business reviews. So I'm also a believer that if leaders don't signal value of an activity, then it's less likely to get traction. So we would ask, how are we doing? Have we closed this feature gap for the payments team? Are they in a position now where they can adopt it? Do they need help? Do they need prioritization and air cover to do the work to move to the new pipeline? We identified a ton of gaps and feedback loops improved because now the product managers for the platform were super connected to their customer. And we just saw all this momentum gained from that. So then the senior leaders roles were really to prioritize the work and prioritize the capacity in the platform team to address the feature gaps versus just moving on to whatever the next thing was. And so it was, it was a really, I think, a great example of an organization recognizing we need to treat our platforms as a product. And it's okay if we're not there yet. Like we need to continue to invest. And once we do get adoption at a place that feels right, we're not done. You're never done. Like you have to continuously invest and understand um, what might be the next thing that you're gonna need to deliver for that community. Okay, so related. So I believe that, you know, a platform team's role is to design for joy. So what are you doing to minimize burden for your customers? And I believe those experiences include the processes. So if you have a platform, but getting access to it is super, super burdensome, it's then you haven't designed for joy. So it should be easy. I talk about, um, 
you know, speed to onboarding or deploying on day one. If your platform is set up in a way to minimize friction, then you can achieve those outcomes. I believe making problems visible matters. So in that example from Nike and even at Nordstrom as well, we didn't really know where the problems were until we made them visible. And then once you make them visible, you can go after them. I included this link to a, a blog post that I really like to leverage because I think a lot of organizations index on velocity, which I think matters, but I also think viscosity matters. If you start to understand the dependencies between teams, and this goes to information flow and team interaction, then you can understand, do we need to build an API? Do we need to build a feature on the platform to minimize or eliminate this dependency? Like having transparency to dependencies is really critical. Uh, I also believe that you need to right size the amount of guardrails and discipline and rigor that you put into an environment. Because if everything becomes highly bureaucratic, then teams are not gonna feel like they're really set up for success. And so I used to work with somebody at Nordstrom. He was my business partner. And he used to say, our role, Courtney, is to create high curbs and then wide boulevards for our teams. So we'll define the curbs and then give the team all the space they need to do whatever they need to do to achieve the outcome. I talked about MPS, deploy on day one. The other thing we did at Nike is we started an initiative called Ship 365. And this was in response to what I consider to be an anti-pattern and risk management theater when you say, freeze all changes. So we're gonna freeze changes during this critical time period often holiday. And in reality, that is sub-optimizing, focusing on and solving for why. Why can we not ship 365 days a year, any time of day? It should be a business decision not to deploy versus a technology reason. So that was a big unlock for us too, to really understand what's keeping our teams from feeling confident in deploying any day of the year, any time of the year. And then one other piece of advice that I've learned throughout my career, and I continue to see this happen in the industry, is that everyone gets very hung up on the definition of a platform and wanting to like define every single platform in the organization and make sure that everybody's operating in the exact same way. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in start small, learn before you scale. And as long as the focus is on treating platforms as products, I think you end up in a really good spot. And again, focus on the developer experience. All right, sorry about that. I feel like my slide advanced. This is a busy slide, but it has a lot of the inspiration that I've leveraged throughout my career. And I just keep adding to it. And at some point I probably need to do something different. Um, but just to share kind of, uh, just where I've gotten a lot of my external inspiration. I feel like being insular is not a good approach. And so there's so many people in the community who are going through either the same journey or they've gone through it already and can share what they've learned. Um, and so over the years, uh, I've collected quite a few different resources that I've leveraged. Um, and that was all that I had. Um, I'd love to take questions if there are any. Cool. Um, thank you so much. Um, I do um, I do know some of the books you're recommending here. Um, great. Uh, I've seen some of the faces in, in earlier meetups. Um, so cool. Yeah, we have two questions and I'm, I'm pretty sure we get more um, once we start diving into this. Um, so first question is from uh, John, um, make problems visible. How is this done? Seems like at some larger companies, engineers know there are problems, but higher ups don't know the pain. So changes are not made. Ah, uh, this is such a great question. I actually took this slide out. Um, I have a ton of passion around what I call senior leadership evolution that is required for uh, 
making problems visible and exactly, John, what you're describing. Often senior leaders, and frankly, even middle managers can be very disconnected from reality. I talk about honoring reality and surfacing reality and that leaders need to be knowledgeable enough about where the problems are to be helpful, not to micromanage, but to genuinely be there to unblock. So my favorite technique is value stream mapping. I think it's a way to bring teams together, put the facts on the table of what is in the way. But senior leaders need to be engaged and not just in action or not just in words, in action. So if I say super important for us to make problems visible, I support us doing a value stream map, go for it. And then I never show up and I never engage and I don't ask any questions, then I'm not really demonstrating my support for problem solving. And then teams need the space to truly problem solve. If you identify something and it requires us to make a trade-off, maybe we have to slow something down. That is a senior leadership uh, commitment to problem solving. So I talk a lot about lean when I talk about leadership evolution too. And I love using the term Gemba. Leaders need to understand and go and see, not go and tell, go and ask questions and understand where the problems are. Now, when I do first 90 days, it's a lot about listening. So another mechanism, if you're not like value stream mapping can be really challenging, especially in a remote uh, situation, listening tours, round tables, connecting with engineers and technical product managers and anyone who's close to the work so I can understand reality. Because if I don't know where the real problems are and I talk about burden a lot, I'm not gonna be able to help in any sort of meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. I think it really requires senior leaders to be actively engaged in what's really going on at the team level and then committing to, uh, and you know, you ask like changes aren't made, committing to those changes, but also in a similar way that we expect our teams to do. We're gonna try something. We might not get it right. Then we're gonna learn from it. And I'm gonna continuously help with us getting to a better place and not just doing a one-time change and then walking away. And then probably also providing the, 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 um, the psychological safety you mentioned earlier to, to allow people to do that. Great, great. Um, cool, so um, Nigel Simpson, first of all, great to have you here, Nigel. Um, uh, always good, remember our, our last meetups. Um, your experiences demonstrate cultural change. Um, what would your advice be to others in large enterprises that are locked into a command and control culture? How do they change the culture? Um, is it always top down? Um, uh, in my experience, it needs to be both. So I've been in scenarios where bottoms up culture change and, and I've seen it in action and I've seen, I will call it limited progress, but great progress. And then it breaks, it breaks down because the tops down is not, they're just really not on board. So I truly believe that you need both. And I think one of the ways that I've seen um, it be successful is shifting away from being output focused to being outcome focused. If you can get leaders to set clear outcomes for the teams and like create the right environment where they're shared outcomes, because some of the culture and the command and control comes from I'm focused on one thing, you're focused on another thing not bad intent, but we're really, we're like sending different signals into the organization. If we share an outcome, then you're really creating an environment where teams are going to come together in order to make something happen. Now, you also have to be mindful of doing that in a way that doesn't create a high tax across the organization. Because if you're collaborating and you need a lot of people to people, human interaction in order to deliver that outcome. That's another area where leaders can say, wait, what would we do to minimize the human interaction and create an environment where teams can self-serve and get what they need to minimize that burden? So um, 
So I truly believe it takes both, but I also believe in, you know, creating that generative culture where leaders need to be uh, creating psychological safety. And the best way I've seen to do that is really to create outcomes and then create what I call a system of accountability. Like how do you continuously understand the health of those outcomes and like demonstrate your commitment to shifting away from command and control? Cool. Um, thanks. Great answer. Um, so another question um, from Schuler. I think we also talked earlier. I think you are also building a platform if I'm not mistaken. Um, thank you for the presentation, Gertney. Uh, what were some of the biggest, bigger barriers your teams encountered um, to get to a self-service internal platform? Personally, I've seen uh, a good identity provider and proper role or attribute-based management being the largest prevention of self-service. Uh, yeah, I mean, that has definitely been a barrier because if you... <sighs> In a lot of cases, there are certain controls that need to exist inside these self-service platforms. And if you don't invest in that early, you end up paying for it later. So finding the right, and you know, I love the use of ident you know, identity provider. I also believe like if you can build in um, things like observability patterns, things that can minimize and I don't know if they're barriers or just friction later that it's super, super important. So um, I think it goes back to saying um, you almost have to go, go slow to go fast. So making sure that you're doing enough of that barrier reduction out of the gate, but also this is another thing that I've seen happen with platform approaches where Sometimes teams want to wait until they have everything perfect before they allow anyone to consume the platform versus take a team or two, figure out their needs, build in as much as you can to make that a relevant experience, and then iterate and learn as you go. Um, so yes, I agree that having some of, I'll call it a uh, I don't like using this term anymore because it feels very old school, but like non-functional requirements, like how are you building some things in to the platform that people don't have to worry about? And you don't end up in a situation where you've got everyone, like if to continue to use the identity example, like everyone's building their own AWS account or everyone's building their own way to get in and access to the system. And then over time that becomes friction. Yeah. Yeah, we, we got an answer from Shirley. He says, yeah, I love this answer. I'm um, not having a beta customer is almost always a death sentence. Um, and I think he's right with that. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the typical way of how you would develop any other product, right? Why would you treat your internal platform any different um, from that? Um, cool, David um, is asking, and, and I really like this question, how small can we start? Um, I'm at a small company and we are already seeing the need to organize the chaos. Does this platform product approach work as a way to generate the culture as we grow? Yeah, great question. I don't know the size of your organization, but for me, um, the organization I'm in now, I would consider to be smaller, especially compared to the organizations that I've been at before. And uh, I'll just share kind of what my version of starting small has been. Um, we have specific use cases in our environment that are candidates for a platform approach. Most of our teams uh, need to, well, let me back up. There are certain use cases where it takes multiple teams in order to deliver that use case or that outcome. And today our integration patterns are not standard. So everybody can kind of do whatever they want. And it was all for the right reasons. So just super quick to say that, like every decision that gets made has the context in the moment. So it wasn't wrong, it's just reality. And now what we're learning is some amount of standardization would actually speed up our teams. And here's the best part around the culture part. Our teams are asking for it. So rather than a leader at my level coming in and saying, 
we are going to implement standards and everyone's going to follow these API versioning standards and contracts will look like this. It's like, I'm not doing that. The teams through the listening tours and understanding the burden have elevated, we need standards. So now we're on a journey where we've started small because we've said, we're not going to boil the ocean. We're not going to like create standards that apply to the entire technology organization. We're going to take two teams and they are working in different tech stacks, but they need to work together. So what might it look like for them to leverage a platform to speed up their delivery? And once we solve for that, we're going to learn a lot. And then we can decide what applies to the other teams. In some cases, maybe it doesn't. So then we need to look at it and say, what other use cases exist in our environment that will, um, that will create the opportunity for us to enhance the platform, uh, maybe introduce different standards that apply and need to exist for these other teams. So I like to start with one to two teams. I prefer to have it grounded in a use case or an outcome. Like if there's a scenario where, um, like I believe in the uh, Dora metrics that come from the book Accelerate. It's like, if you're looking at deployment frequency, percent change failure rate, lead time for change, and mean time to restore service, you're going to get an indicator of maybe where you want to start first. Because if teams are having a hard time with uh, frequency of deployment, or every time they deploy a change, they have to roll it back. That could be an area where you say, this might be a candidate for us to create a platform for them to um, improve those outcomes. Great, great answer. So you're on that journey yourself. Um, yes. In your in your new role. Um, great, cool. I think those were the questions. Um, great questions. Thanks. Um, it's also good to see so many people staying for the whole time. So we had 50 plus, I know it's always difficult to see if you're a participant, but we are at 50 plus participants. So it's really cool. Um, thank you so much, um, Courtney, that was great. Um, thanks for giving us some insights into how you think about platforms and how you actually manage to build them and how you foster them. Um, I think it's a lot about mindset. Um, we make sure to send out the recording tomorrow. Uh, we'll include your Twitter handle. Um, to make sure people know where to look. Um, and so, yeah, thanks everybody for joining and uh, hopefully see you at the next meetup. Thank you. Bye.